Hi guys, this is DK from NASA Spaceflight, and we have just gotten one of the biggest updates about when we can expect a full Starship launch. And I mean a full stack Starship on Super Heavy Booster Launch, the biggest rocket humans have ever assembled. On Friday, September 17th, the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, released the Draft Environmental Assessment for SpaceX's Boca Chica launch site. Inside were some new details about how SpaceX plans to operate Starship and Super Heavy launches from the site, as well as future expansions of the facility. Okay, great. So what is the environmental assessment? This environmental assessment is a comprehensive study of the entire Boca Chica launch site, surrounding areas and communities, as well as SpaceX's future plans. As the name suggests, it deals with any environmental impacts that operations at the launch site will have. It discusses air and particulate pollution, wildlife, and light and sound emissions, including sonic booms. It also discusses impacts on cultural landmarks, as well as impacts on homeowners around the launch site. In addition, the report discusses how SpaceX will work with agencies to address concerns and deal with any anomalies. Based on its findings, the FAA would either give SpaceX the OK to apply for an experimental permit or operational license from the Boca Chica site, or they would have to go and conduct further studies. For now, it seems that the FAA hasn't found any significant issues. And for anyone wondering about Starship operations from elsewhere, specifically Florida, another review would have to take place for any future launch sites. The document said that SpaceX looked into launching Starship from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral and Slick 4E at Vandenberg. Falcon 9 launches from both sites, and the Starship construction and operations would get in the way of Falcon launches. In addition, SpaceX would have to work with other launch providers and range operators at those sites to schedule Starship launches. Because of these reasons, both sites were disqualified. This whole report may not sound too interesting, but it has a major part to play in future launches from the site. Also, because the FAA had to analyze and discuss SpaceX's future plans, we got some new information about the future of Starbase at Boca Chica. First off, SpaceX is planning to construct a second orbital launch site called, you know, Pad B. This will essentially be a copy of the one currently under construction, Pad A. Pad B will have its own integration tower as well as its own tank farm. Just like on the suborbital side where they have two launch pads, SpaceX wants redundancy on the orbital side of the launch site. With Pad B as well as Pad A, SpaceX is still unsure whether or not they should employ flame diverters to help dissipate the massive exhaust plume created by all those Raptor engines. They're also unsure if sound suppression water should spray directly into the rocket's plume or just around the pad. It's possible that SpaceX has made up its mind since the draft environmental assessment was written, but this is what was in the document, so it's all we have to go on right now. We'll just have to wait and see what they end up doing once super heavy static fire testing begins. West of Orbital Pad B toward the suborbital launch site, there will be a new landing pad, Landing Pad B, as well as another dedicated structural test stand. At the structural test stands, test tanks will be tested and pushed to failure. Most previous test stands have simply been set on transport mounts and hooked up to the tank farm using temporary hoses. According to the draft assessment, the new stand will feature more permanent piping and structures, but no further information was provided. SpaceX expects to have a maximum of 10 tank tests per month. Speaking of tank testing, let's take a moment to discuss the different types of testing SpaceX says that they will do. So seasoned tank watchers will already be familiar with these tests, but thanks to the draft EA, we get some naming corrections and some interesting details. There are two categories of testing described in the document, proof pressure testing and developmental testing. There are two types of proof pressure testing. First, what we have previously referred to as ambient proof testing. This document calls pneumatic proof testing. This is where the tank is pressurized with gas rather than liquid. The other type of proof pressure testing described is cryogenic proof testing. This is where cryogenic liquid nitrogen, methane, or liquid oxygen is loaded into the tanks, which are then pressurized past their rated limit to confirm their structural capability with appropriate factors of safety. Starship's flight pressure inside its fuel tanks is about six bar, or six times Earth's atmospheric pressure. SpaceX tests the resilience of the tanks by pressurizing them above six bar to around eight bar, or eight times Earth's atmospheric pressure. Aside from proof pressure testing, there's also developmental testing. This includes two types of burst testing, hydrostatic, using water, or cryogenic, using liquid nitrogen or liquid oxygen. During developmental testing, tanks are pressurized to a specific limit or to deliberate failure, and the test media used is deliberately released into the environment. We've all seen these types of tests before, but it's nice to have some information in terms of the technical jargon. Additionally, the document notes that SpaceX will conduct tank tests on every Super Heavy and Starship prototype that is built, saying specifically, 
SpaceX is planning to conduct the tank tests described above for each Super Heavy and Starship prototype that is built until the test is successful. If a test is unsuccessful and results in damage to the test vehicle, SpaceX would construct and test a new test vehicle. Once tank tests are successful, SpaceX would conduct a static fire engine test. To accommodate the new structural test stand and orbital pad B, the launch site footprint will be expanded to SpaceX's property line, totaling about 40 acres. The current site only makes up for a portion of the company's land. Here you can see how SpaceX plans to extend the footprint of the launch site, or as the draft EA calls it, the vertical launch area. We're just going to keep on calling it the launch site for simplicity's sake. Also, with this additional space, SpaceX will dig two new water wells and build a desalination plant to remove salt from the water. Currently, the one well has been drilled at the site to use as sound and fire suppression for the suborbital launch site. At least some of this water seems to be stored in Starhopper, which is lovingly labeled as a water tower in this diagram. The two new wells will be used for fetching sound and fire suppression water for orbital launches. The launch site isn't the only thing that we can expect to expand. At the build site, SpaceX is planning to construct a large payload processing facility. This building will receive payloads to be launched on Starship. There, they will perform final processing and fueling before integrating the payload into Starship. The building will be up to 240 feet or 73 meters tall and have a footprint of up to 22,000 square feet or 2,044 square meters. For comparison, the current high bay at the site is about 265 feet tall, so the payload processing facility has the potential to be a truly massive building. The document also discusses the liquid oxygen plant currently being built. In addition, SpaceX will construct a natural gas processing facility and a liquefier to create pure liquid methane. A new natural gas power plant at the site was mentioned, which may have already been constructed. During the summer, we saw natural gas generators being installed at the propellant production site. These may be part of the power plant mentioned. The document states that the final location of the plant has not yet been determined, but that it will generate 250 megawatts of power. The excess heat from the plant may be used by the desalinator if the power plant is built at the launch site. Speaking of power, the solar farm near the village will be expanded. It currently takes up 1.7 acres and generates 1 megawatt. SpaceX has proposed to increase this by 750 kilowatts to 1.7 megawatts, along with an additional battery system for up to 8 megawatt hours of energy storage. The document states that the solar farm may be expanded up to 7 acres in size. In addition, it confirms that the launch site is currently being powered by the solar farm. That's it for major infrastructure changes mentioned. Let's take a look at what the report says about launch operations. In Starship's developmental phase, SpaceX will be limited to 3 super heavy launches and 20 suborbital Starship launches per year. In the operational phase, this will change to 5 super heavy launches and 5 Starship launches per year. SpaceX will also be able to land five super heavy boosters on land per year in this phase. This flight rate is quite low compared to SpaceX's eventual goal of several launches per day. In addition, launches beyond low Earth orbit will require several refuelings, possibly around a dozen for human landing system missions to the moon. It's likely that SpaceX will try to get the allowed flights increased in the near future, which would require a new but shorter environmental assessment to be completed. In the developmental phase, orbital launches are expected to follow an initial mission profile where the vehicle lifts off from Boca Chica and Starship re-enters and lands in the Pacific Ocean. The report also states that SpaceX is also looking to possibly land on islands in the Pacific later on. Most of these launches should take place between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. local time, but since delays are a common part of spaceflight, some will inevitably be pushed later into the night. Different flight profiles may be proposed, but they would have to be approved separately. A common question we get is if SpaceX might build a second road or even a rail line to the launch site to help reduce the traffic from road closures. Well, in the draft EA, SpaceX proposes not a new road, but rather to add three pull-offs along Highway 4 to allow traffic to pull onto a widened shoulder so the transporter can pass. The proposed locations of the three pull-offs are shown in Figure 2-7. The document goes on to say that the pull-offs would be approximately 75 feet long by 30 feet wide, and that with three pull-offs combined with the transporter's speed of 2 miles per hour, the maximum wait time of about 20 minutes for drivers would be expected. This means that it would not be necessary to close Highway 4 entirely in both directions, as they do now, to transport Starship or Super Heavy Boosters. Sonic boom studies were a large part of the assessment. A sonic boom is a pressure wave formed by a vehicle moving faster than the speed of sound. The pressure from a sonic boom can damage property if it's large enough. Currently, it's not expected that sonic booms from operations will significantly impact populated areas. We also get a peek at the closure map during orbital flights. 
On this chart, only SpaceX and emergency personnel would be allowed within the light yellow area. The purple area would be open to landowners in that area, and then the black stripe area would be completely closed off from any personnel. Finally, let's discuss the wildlife impacts that these operations will have. The document states that the direct impact on unprotected species will be extremely low, including by sonic booms and direct impacts from debris. Leftover propellants from water landings would quickly dissipate and provide no major impact on marine life. Effects on sea turtle nesting will be mitigated by creating a lighting plan for the site. Turtle nesting can be negatively affected by bright lights, so planning ahead for lighting can protect the endangered species. Just over 30 acres of habitat would be removed by the operations at the site, although the assessment states that this is a small fraction of the habitat space available in the area. To mitigate any other impacts, SpaceX will take precautions like training personnel about fire and pollution safety, not dumping water or material into waterways, ensuring hydraulics and gas tanks do not leak, and others. Biologists would be hired for worker education as well as monitoring the biological status of the site. For now, the environmental assessment is in a 30-day public comment period, which lasts until October 18th, though this period could be extended. From there, the FAA will take the public feedback it's received and use it to formulate the final report. There is no set time for the finished report to be released, but it will likely take several months to be completed. There's way more in this report itself than can be fit in this video, so if you're interested, give it a read. And since it's a public feedback period, people are able to send their thoughts to the FAA, which you should totally do. You'll be able to find the appropriate contact information in the description below. And that's it. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future videos talking about Starship operations down in Boca Chica. This video was written by Ian Atkinson and Jack Beyer with help from Josh Mill from the NSF Discord, which you can totally join by clicking that little join button and becoming a channel member. Again, my name is DK. Thanks for watching.